I personally thought 3D printing was like the stupidest thing <laughs> I'd ever heard of. And because as a polymer chemist, I was like, this is so boring. The materials are like, you know, it's like a hot glue gun on a stick for the, you know, the FDM style ones that were becoming kind of democratized at the time. And, you know, then on the photopolymerization side, it was just like, man, this is like, you know, chemistry from the 50s that <laughs> were just like, you know, slapping onto these things. And, and I actually, so one, it took me a little while personally to, to realize like, oh, whoa, all the reasons that I'm so negative about 3D printing are because the materials aren't there yet, right? And so then I, I kind of took that negativity and spun it completely on its head, <laughs> decided to start a company <laughs> dedicated to solving that. Um, but we, you know, we say at Polyspectra that our, our mission is to create engineering grade additive materials that help designers, inventors, and engineers make their ideas real. So really trying to uh, help people find true production additive applications. We're not against it if you want to use it as a tool or a jig or a fixture, but we're primarily really focused on um, directly printing durable and used parts. Um, I've been a mega fan of Asiga for a very long time. We've been, you know, customer for many years and partner for for many years as well. Um, so here's just a picture to prove it of me in action about a year ago when everything was locked down. And the only thing that we were working on was printing Venturi valves to try to help people oh. build COVID ventilators. So so I don't even know, Justin, if you knew you were a big part of that story, but all of, all of the ventilator that work that we did were, were on your printers. So um, yeah. that, was, that was really uh, scary times, but fun to feel like we were doing something important. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just share super quickly. We're gonna we're gonna focus really on resin uh, for this webinar. But over the years, you know, even though I'm a chemist and we started the the company to commercialize this resin, and that's kind of the main business model for us, we've realized that we need to, in many cases, meet the customer where they're at, especially in these areas where we're thinking about production, and so. We've actually, we sort of accidentally got really good at design for additive and we're happy to help people with that. Um, in particular, like spend a lot of time in, in end topology, which is a really fun tool. Uh, we sell a lot of parts um, and that's a, a way for, for folks, even if they wanna bring this in house eventually, it's a way for us to quickly show them, hey, this is what we can do. Let's start qualifying this. Let's make sure this is gonna work for you. Uh, we're going to talk about resin and then I sort of the partnership piece I mentioned at the end, you know, for applications where it's literally impossible to make today, we're open to working with, you know, larger firms that that are kind of uh, know they want to make this transition into additive, but know that they can't do it with what's out there today. So anyways, to focus on the resin, uh, I guess this is the the shorter gift version of the blender video I, again i don't want to knock the competition so I, I will let the black engineering grade acrylate material remain nameless for now but this is uh another very satisfying visual demonstration of just showing the difference in terms of impact strength um so you know to justin already highlighted a lot of this stuff around the being brittle most folks on the call will probably have some sense of being aware of these, what some people call the Z-strength issue in, in FDM printing in particular. But even in SLA, it's you can't take it for granted that you're gonna get isotropic properties. And that's yeah. something that we, we actually were surprised because when we first got in the field, everyone in SLA says, oh, it's, it's isotropic, you know, read our white paper. But then when we start talking to the real you know, engineering customers, they're like, uh, yeah, actually, no, it isn't. Uh, so can we check your isotropy? <laughs> so this is an area that, um, you know, is challenging. We've worked really hard to prove that we're, our stuff is isotropic. We'll, we'll even show you error bars <laughs> on the data if you want. Um, and then, then I guess all of that is just about the properties on day one. And, but for true durable goods at production, manufacturing, 
you need to know that this thing is going to survive if it gets warm, survive if it goes outside. It's not going to leach horrible things <laughs> onto your body or into the environment. Um, and so those are all the weathering is also something that we're working very actively and it's challenging. It does take a long time and every customer has a different requirement. And you know what works in auto doesn't work in arrow and what works in one medical device might not be exactly the same as the others. Um, but that's also something that, that we're working really hard on. So super high level for cyclical and resin, uh, that's the acronym for core. This is the new family of materials that we have. Um, you know, we're focused on high toughness and ductility, high working temperature, uh, very strong chemical resistance. So to date, we've only found one solvent that we can't withstand. Um, I'm sure if we really got creative, we could destroy this stuff with some really nasty things, but this stands up very well to uh, jet fuel, to salt water, to most organic solvents that you can think of. Um, and we've had a lot of customers find success in, in those areas. Um, the weathering, again, depending on your application, we might not have the data like ready to send to you because some of these things take a long time, but the work that we've done today is really promising on this. Um, and we've never gotten anything less than a perfect score on the biocompatibility tests that we've done. So again, we have, we've not done animal testing uh, ourselves, uh, but for the you know, basic cytotoxicity, we have always gotten the grade zero perfect score. Um, on the resin side, again, I was hinting at shrinkage is really important for accuracy. I will not go into the uh, level of detail required to maybe explain that to everybody, but uh, we have very low volumetric shrinkage in the polymerization, which enables us to, to print parts that are very dimensionally stable. Um, we can print at pretty low viscosities, which is helpful for um, lowering the separation forces and kind of keeping the, the print times, uh, you know, pretty quick. Uh, we're not as fast as an acrylate, but but part of how we're able to compete is through low viscosity. Um, and right now we're focused on supporting, so for this call, we're focused on supporting uh, 385 nanometer uh, printers uh, with, with the, the resin version that we're gonna be shipping quickly. Um, but we do have the ability to tune that. So if there's folks on the line that are like, whatever, completely married to 405 for some reason, we can, we can still chat about it, but it's not gonna be the first thing that we're supporting. Um, I hinted a little bit about this earlier, I guess just for fun, I'll share my, as a, uh, so I won't go into the whole story, but one of the fun things to do as an academic and uh, is like make acronyms for things. So my mm -hmm. acronym for the mechanism when we first uh, invented this was uh, photolithographic olefin metathesis polymerization, which is PLOMP. And uh, <laughs> we, we decided later that core sounded like more of like a, a product, um, but but in the literature, PLOMP is 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 the term and uh, folks, folks, a couple of folks in the field have kind of kept using uh, using that, which is lots of fun. And and actually just for context, also we, we when we first discovered this, um, it was in the context of traditional lithography. So spinning films on silicon with a mask aligner like you do for making the integrated circuits. And, and I've actually done some nano 3D printing uh, uh, with a thing called a nanoscribe, which is a multi-photon uh, 3D printer. Um, but anyways, as a business right now, we're super focused on uh, stereolithography and in particular the 385 DLP. Uh, style printer that that Asiga does such a great job with. Um, I want to get through these pretty quickly, not to totally bore everybody. There is at this link um, the Genius slash Core Alpha TDS. You can also find this on our website, um, and I can put it in the chat later. You can get the whole spec sheet for those who want to dive in. But some of the things I didn't mention: we have extremely low moisture absorption, which is really important for stability. Um, I already talked about chemical resistance. This is a great insulator and has really, really low dielectric loss and a very low dielectric coefficient. Uh, and I don't have the breakdown strength here. And I don't, to be honest, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but I remember that being a, a big 
deal for some of the customers that we have um, who are working on maybe higher voltage uh, electronics, for example, wanting to incorporate parts into those. Um, and then another thing on the brittleness, we can actually retain 80% of our impact strength at minus 50 C. So this is really important for aerospace and when you're gonna get up into you know, low earth orbit or space space, right? Which is that ability to go hot and cold and maintain the properties is really critical. Um, so then just to put it on a chart, again, we, we don't like to spend a lot of energy sort of knocking other people, but I think it is important to kind of give people some bullet, bullet points to compare. So, so Core Alpha, we're, um, I, I guess the other thing I'll say is that we, um, so we're with Core Alpha, we're at 20% elongation of break and a HCT around uh, 120 C, depending on which pressure you're using. Um, the glass transition temperature of the network for those who prefer that is about 150 C. Um, and for every, so you can see on this chart, there's in the whole space. So the black dots are just sort of other photopolymers for SLA. And we highlighted a few kind of notable brands, um, but there's always this trade-off between toughness and heat resistance that I mentioned earlier. Um, and that's true for any material, but by using completely different chemistry than what other people have, we're on a completely different curve than the other materials that are out there. And so this is really the white space that, that we've targeted uh, for this first product. Um, and, um, you know, that's, that's been really exciting for our customers to finally be able to print something that isn't gonna shatter or deform if it gets warm. <laughs> um, and then just super quickly, you know, we, I'm sure we have a lot of our customers uh, on the line and Justin's got a lot of his customers on the line. The vast majority of the really cool stuff that we've done, unfortunately, is currently locked up under NDA, so I can't share it, but I will say, uh, we've been very successful in helping uh, a lot of leading organizations in auto aero, defense, robotics, medical, dental, all these application areas with their problems. Um, and so we'll get a little bit uh, towards the very end, we're going to re we're going to come back to thinking about some specific applications. But I, I do want to highlight that, you know, while we haven't been able to kind of publicly share a lot uh, with those folks. Uh, it, you know, it is um, an active area for us and it's been really fun to collaborate with some of these, these folks. So.